Elevenses. So Elevenses uh, was introduced to me by Michael Broadbent, my predecessor by many years at Christie's. And uh, Michael wrote in his book, uh, Vintage Wine, that he would invite everyone into his office at 11 a.m. for a little glass of Madeira to talk about the day's business. <laughs> so what I did is I decided to invite people into my office when I was at Christie's for a glass of champagne to talk about the day's business. And now I'm inviting you. This is my office because I'm working from home. And I think, uh, what a I pleasure. think it's entirely appropriate. And uh, so that's the concept. I'm glad you came. We're going to have a different winemaker every time. And this week we have Morton and Lisa Hallgren from Ravines in the Finger Lakes. And and for those of you who don't know, probably not many of you know, I just finished a Finger Lakes regional report for Decanter Magazine. It's at the printer right now and it's getting mailed out next week. And you'll see all my thoughts about the Finger Lakes starting on Monday. And I don't want to, I may have to issue a spoiler alert because <laughs> Ravines is one of the uh, uh, wineries that's featured prominently in the article and, and I really, fell head over heel with these wines when I was doing the report for Decanter, and that is the reason um, for today's Zoom. So that's uh, that's that. Can Morton and Lisa, you guys can hear me okay, right? Yes. Yeah, you're fine. Perfect, because it's supposed to be on speaker view, but when I'm speaking, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't say that. Anyhow, that doesn't matter because I'm going to stop speaking shortly, and it will be you who's speaking. So uh, I was wondering, maybe to start, if we could talk a little bit about what's going on in the Finger Lakes, the 2020 growing season, harvest, where you're at, how the grapes look and everything like that. Absolutely. And you, you picked the perfect wine to introduce that concept because the only grapes we've harvested so far are the grapes for our sparkling wine. Okay. Um, so 2020, on top of everything else that's going on in the world, is shaping up to be a spectacular vintage in the Finger Lakes. Uh, earliest record, uh, harvest on record. Uh, minimal disease pressure. Everything is gearing up towards a really, really promising vintage that we're just starting now. Um, with, with sparkling grapes, and we're just now starting to transition over to the red Pinot Noirs, but sparkling uh, base wine is all we have fermenting in the cellar right now. Okay, interesting. So uh, so how did it start? Was the, the winter before bud break, was cold as usual in the Finger Lakes or not as cold as normal or? Not as cold as normal, not cold enough to have bud damage at full dormancy because what we deal with in the Finger Lakes is rarely ever spring frost. It's uh, seeing damage at full, dormant, full dormancy during the winter, and we did not see any of that this year. Okay, okay. And then bud break started around when? Uh, late, about a week into May. I remember mm -hmm. we were doing a, a virtual tasting out of our kitchen in Penyan, and we were looking out the window, it was snowing. Wow. And all of a sudden, and this happens typically in the Finger Lakes, about a week later, just like a switch, we went from cool and, and damp to hot and dry. And it's basically stayed hot and dry ever since mid-late May. So we are, wow. we're in a very unusual situation in the Finger Lakes this year. Okay. And when was flowering? Flowering happened in, uh, in June, as it, as it typically does. And the veraison happened quite early this year. We were barely into August for some of these varieties. Um, so we're, it's not, it doesn't happen very often, but we actually have extra growing season. And normally in the Finger Lakes, it's how much more can we get? But this year we're actually running so far ahead of where we normally are that uh, we can feel good about uh, being able to ripen even late ripening varieties. Okay, fantastic. So normally, is it? Uh, do you get a hundred days between between uh, flowering and harvest, or not? We do. We yeah. do. Uh, sometimes even a, a little bit more. We have a a bit of a marathon harvest season, and part of it comes from working with different grape varieties. 
Uh, in a typical year, we start the second or the third week of September with sparkling grapes, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Mm. And most years we wrap it up right around Halloween, maybe the first week of November with the Cabernets. But this year, I don't expect to have any grapes left in the vineyard by the 25th or the 28th of October. Okay, fantastic. That's really interesting. Yeah, the last time we had uh, we had Larry Stone from Oregon talking about his harvest, and they picked uh, uh, Pinot before Chardonnay because they said it was getting shriveled. They had so much heat, and uh, and they're well along. And at the, that point, so two weeks ago, Dominique Lafon in Burgundy had finished everything. All of his tanks had fermented and he'd pressed everything off and he was very happy because he was done completely. So wow. to me, it's fascinating to have a, such a huge difference between, uh, between the Finger Lakes and Oregon and Burgundy, all of which people think of nominally as cool climate regions. But, uh, but the grapes evolve very differently in spite of the fact that uh, they have some characteristics in common. Yes, I mean, we see a tremendous amount of uh, vintage variation. We're in a very continental climate, mm. and there's basically nothing between us and the Arctic north of Canada. So our growing conditions, I refer to it a roller coaster ride of vintages. We can see hot, cold, dry, wet, typically a little bit of everything during a season. And this year, if anything, has been almost more like a drought season, more than I ever remember seeing in the Finger Lakes before. Right, because most of the uh, most years you'll get at least some rain during the growing season, right? That's right. Do a lot of people do dry farming in the Finger Lakes? Uh, just about everything is dry farmed. Uh, Cornell University, which is a great resource where we are, they have for the last 10, 15 years recommended uh, installa installing drip irrigation but mainly for the purpose of establishing the vineyard and using it for the first four or five years. So uh, we do have one vineyard that has been drip irrigation because of that, but we can go four or five years between turning on the irrigation in any okay. one vineyard. So we are, we are essentially dry farms. Fantastic. So maybe we should introduce uh, Ravines by having you tell a little bit about uh, how you got to the Finger Lakes because you're not from there originally and uh, how you set it up. Sure. So uh, I'm going to put we, my sparkling wine back in the fridge. I'll be right back. Absolutely. So we, we took sort of the, the long road to, to the Finger Lakes. Um, Lisa is originally from San Antonio, Texas, and my hometown is Copenhagen, Denmark, and we got into the grape growing and winemaking business in, in Provence at my, my family's winery in Côte de Provence many years ago. And after completing my enology degree in, in Montpellier and a brief uh, stay at, at Custes Donnell, we went through West Texas where we worked for the Cordier Company onto the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, and finally arrived in the Finger Lakes in 1999, where I took a job as head winemaker for, for another winery here by the name of Constantine Frank. Mm. And it was a, a bit of a revelation, and both Lisa and I, after a very short time, saw tremendous potential in the Finger Lakes to the extent that the very next year we bought our first piece of land already projecting the creating what's now uh, Ravine's wine cellars starting down on, on Cuca Lake. And by mm. the way, we had to sell our car for the down payment because we had no money. <laughs> wow. wow. A real um, crap operation. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was a, it was really, I think of it as a unique opportunity and one of those cases of being at the right time uh, at the right place. I mean, I, I realized then how easy it was to grow grapes and make wine in, in Provence uh, in, in the Mediterranean climate. And the Finger Lakes was a whole new level of, of challenge, but a challenge that uh, we wanted to take. So as any winemaker would, during my early years in the Finger Lakes, I became acquainted with a number of grape growers and their vineyard sites. 
And it didn't take long before I had my list of favorite sites and, and favorite growers, like most winemakers would. And luckily, many of those sites are the sites that I work with now. The Argosinga Vineyard, the 16 Falls Vineyard, the White Springs Vineyard. Mm -hmm. So we have transitioned over the years from sourcing all of our grapes from our grape growing friends uh, around the Finger Lakes to now being roughly 85% uh, estate grown. We, we farm wow. almost, almost 130 acres of our own. And the, the Argentina Vineyard is now the one outside vineyard that we work with. We work with uh, th that entire vineyard and have for, for many years since we started. That's a fantastic spot. So I have a question for you. In sure. Provence, the grape blend was very different than the grape blend in the Finger Lakes. How long did it take you to adapt to using different varietals and a completely different climate? It took quite a, quite a bit of time. So between working uh, out in the West Texas in the Chihuahua Desert and now in the Finger Lakes, I think I have the, the full range of of growing conditions from the hottest to the coldest. Yeah. And yes, um, there, I think the only overlapping varieties would be uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and, uh, and a tiny bit of Chardonnay. Uh, but yes, we basically had to rethink. Uh, obviously now we're very much in a cool climate wine region where Mediterranean grape varieties would probably not survive the, the first winter. Right. And and we've had to basically rethink just about everything we know or think we know about grape growing and winemaking, concepts like ripeness, uh, rethinking balance in the wine, a um, lot of different viticultural practices, working with multiple trunks in the vineyard, filling up graft unions, and really being quite flexible in how we work in the cellar year to year uh, to respond to these highly variable ripening conditions we have as opposed to the more undulating if not con more constant conditions that we encountered in Provence. It's been quite a transition. I imagine, I imagine and to me you're sparkling wine you know and to, picking time is an interesting topic I think and uh, to me, your sparkling wine is fantastic. You know, I have a background in, in um, sparkling wine and champagne, and so I'm always very curious. And maybe you could talk a little bit about the, how you decide the picking times and uh, the process you go about in the vineyard with the uh, uh, grapes for the sparkling wine. Absolutely. So let me first briefly describe the, the Argetsinger Vineyard. It is a vineyard site on the southeast side of Seneca Lake, sitting quite high up above Seneca Lake with a pretty much westerly exposure. Uh, it's sitting on a rare sliver of uh, limestone soil, mm -hmm. extremely well-drained site. By Finger Lake standard, it's a fairly old vineyard. It's uh, now pushing uh, 35, 36 years old, uh, well-balanced, low vigor vineyard site. And uh, both the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir for our sparkling wine are, are grown down there. And I would say, if anything, the conditions of 2012, which is the vintage we're tasting, I think it'll be the closest one in terms of comparing it with the conditions we're dealing with this year. Ah, okay. And over the years, I've become more and more comfortable with picking uh, Chardonnay at higher and higher bricks level. To the point where now a, a normal bricks level for us at harvest time would be about 19 and a half. Certainly going for a for fuller, a richer, riper style of, of sparkling wine. And we also shown the commitment and the patience to long aging in, in the bottle on the lease. So six years or so is sort of typical aging time for us for the sparkling wine. So you're picking at 19 and a half bricks and the, the pH is about where? Yeah, 3.1, give or take a little. Okay, interesting. And was that the case with the vintage that we're tasting now, the 2012? Yes, uh, it might have been 315, but not higher than that. 
Okay, interesting. Because, you know, you really get a, a very thirst quench, quenching kind of freshness to it that, uh, that's, you know, it's got that really beautiful lemony acidity. And uh, the, the breakdown in the 2012 between Chard and Pinot was how much? It's nearly 50-50 within two percentage points. Okay, because some years you make a Blanc de Blanc from the same vineyard, right? That's right. We just released our 2013 a uh, week or two ago. Yeah, I tasted that for Decanter. That was also very impressive. Did you not like the Pinot or you wanted to do a different uh, experiment or? Uh, we made a, a Brut Rosé. Ah, okay. I didn't taste the Rosé. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> How much of the sparkling wine do you make? So we have been increasing our sparkling wine production a little bit. Um, we've transitioned from making three to 400 cases a year to nearly the double of that. I've had some difficult decisions to make over the years because mm. the, the grapes that go into the sparkling wine have in the past had other possible destinations. We have made right. a, a fairly popular uh, stainless steel fermented Chardonnay uh, on full leaves with no malolactic and we also use the Pinot Noir grapes for there for our Pinot Noir rosé wine but given um, given the potential for sparkling wine uh, it's very difficult for me not to allocate more and more of these grapes to sparkling wine if not all of them so we, we we've been able to increase the production without changing vineyard site, which to me is kind of critical. Right. Um, we are in a relatively new wine region, but because we, we started nearly 20 years ago, I've been able to kind of zero in on the vineyard sites we work with. And at this point, we largely continue working with the same sites, not having to add extra sites, um, which I think is really important, this idea of getting a chance to, to know your sites. Uh, especially in a region where you have so much vintage variation. Oh, that definitely makes sense. So overall, maybe you could describe overall the, the proportion that's uh, Riesling, the proportion that's red wine, the, you know, the breakdown of your production. Sure. So uh, nearly 50% of our production is Riesling. And early on, we decided to focus exclusively on the on the dry side having said that we have over the last couple of years diverted a portion of our riesling grapes towards sparkling wine which mm. uh, will start to show up uh, next year ah. um, then about 35 percent of our production is red uh, the three main wines being pinot noir cabernet franc and uh, a bordeaux blend and then the balance are other white varieties such as Chardonnay, uh, Gewürztraminer, a little bit of, of a couple of other uh, varieties. Okay, fantastic. So that's quite a range because uh, Riesling is very late ripening and uh, the Chardonnay and Pinot for the sparkling are picked very early. So you have quite a drawn out harvest. When do you think you'll finish the, the harvest? So this year, I expect it to be somewhere around the 25th or 28th of October. Um, we have gone as late as November 14th before. It is a, a bit of a marathon. Mm. I bet it it's, is. It's quite testing on, on our crew here uh, with harvest that never seems to end. Yeah, right. I bet. So how many cases in total is the production across all... So this is so this is the Finger Lakes. I think of us as a 25,000 case winery uh, because with 130 acres or so in production, that really is what we should produce. But we have years where production is more like 14 or 15,000 because of various winter injury uh, mm -hmm. related issues. But at full production, we should be a 25,000 case winery. How much, how, how bad is the damage from the cold in, in some years? What's the per rough percentage that you lose to? Uh... So each grape variety has a temperature where you lose 50% of the buds at full dormancy. And that's kind of how you classify the grape varieties. 
And Riesling and Cabernet Franc are the two hardiest grape varieties commonly grown in the Finger Lakes, in the Vinifera family. Mm -hmm. So it's not a coincidence that makes up a good portion of our blend. Um, the least cold resistant varieties commonly grown in the Finger Lakes are varieties like Sauvignon Blanc, Gewürztraminer, and Merlot. And when you get down to those varieties, um, production can literally swing by a factor of 10. Wow. Which wow. is scary. That's seriously scary. Yes. Um, so you, so it, number one, you're sort of limited in the range of varieties you can grow with. There are a few people here testing out Syrah and Shannon and possibly even some Rhone varietals. Hmm. I, I wish them the best of luck, but it's yeah, right. a risky proposition. For the most part, we really are limited to uh, cool climate varieties, but I don't think of that as a bad situation. It seems to me that North America is terribly short of cool climate grape. I agree. Grape. I totally agree with that. And, and in general, I, I am on board with your thoughts in that regard. Although I have to say, I did taste the Syrah from Elements that, uh, that uh, Christopher Bates did, and I thought he did a very nice job with it, because Syrah is not the first thing that you'd think of as growing in the Finger Lakes so well, but... Uh... It, absolutely. I, I personally had an interest in planting Mondeuse years ago, but I couldn't find any plant material. Oh, um, really? Yeah. That brings me to another question. You know, one of the reasons I picked Cerise is because of the Blaufrankisch. And uh, I think I think Blaufrankisch to me has a lot of potential. And there's a few other people growing Blaufrankisch in the Finger Lakes as well, isn't there? Absolutely. It's been around here uh, since before we came to the region. Nobody grows tremendous amounts of it, but everybody has a couple of acres of it in their vineyards. Um, you see some varietal red wines. I have made small batches of rosé wine in the past, mm -hmm. but most of it is used for blending. Many of my colleagues uh, blend it with Cabernet Franc. I found it to be one of the very few, personally, the only variety I've come across that blends nicely with Pinot Noir, which is what our Achilles blend is. Right, exactly. So, you know, it seems like we're almost halfway in. I think we should get started uh, tasting some wine. What's the order you'd like to taste in? Uh, I'm, it would seem to me we should go sparkling, Riesling, Cerise, I would propose. Okay, that works for me. I'll, I'll just top up my sparkling and I'll be right back and we can chat about that. <laughs> sure. I'll top mine too. It seems like I drank it. most of There's not that many occasions that we get a chance to drink sparkling wine at 11 o'clock in the morning and call it work, so. <laughs> but cheers to that. <laughs> hmm. Unless, of course, you're hanging out with Charles, in which case it's perfectly normal, so. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a happy from you, Michael. What's that? I, I was gonna say, do you mind if we steal the idea and we have an 11, 11s here at the um, at You Ravine? totally should. I think we should yeah. make it a thing. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I've turned into a big fan. And you know what? I, I only do it every other week, um, but I really look forward to it. I was thinking, oh, yeah, it's Friday, it's 11s, <laughs> and I was very, very cheerful. So I love, as, as I already said, I love the sparkling wine. And we've gone over a little bit about the grape blend. One thing I wanted to ask, I'm assuming that for the sparkling wine, you do, you're handpicking everything. Yes. So... Um, all, so we work essentially with four different vineyard sites plus the Argentina vineyard site and all of the vineyard sites that are all but one of them, all of the ones that are not adjacent to the winery are entirely handpicked. Mm. So the Argentina vineyard, 16 Falls, our two vineyard sites down in Cuba are 100% handpicked. Here at Geneva at the White Springs vineyard, we do some hand harvesting and some mechanical harvesting. Um, because I can have the grapes go from the vineyard to the press in 30 minutes, at which point mm -hmm. mechanical harvesting becomes perfectly acceptable for some varieties under some circumstances. Um, but everything from the other sites is handpicked, including this. Right. Okay, great. And then you do a whole cluster pressing? That's right. A long, gentle, three-hour press cycle, uh, sort of traditional champagne pressing, uh, gradually implementing 
the, the pressure and, and cutting off the hard press fraction. Um, that's right. Okay. And, and then you do all the, the uh, first ferments in stainless, huh? Yes. Then we have uh, slow, cool fermentations uh, in stainless steel. Um, typically, I mean, in 58, 59, 60 Fahrenheit. Uh, just aiming for the smoothest possible fermentation for the for the sparkling base wine, as uneventful and boring as possible. Um, and then uh, we have back when we made this wine, we were we would we would bottle it up for the second fermentation in May. Uh, since then, we moved that up a little bit uh, earlier, but this was bottled in in May of uh, thirteen. Uh, okay. So they, they all do their mallow, huh? No, no mallow in here. No mallow at all? Okay. No. That's why no, it no. has such a fantastic freshness. Yeah, no, no mallow lactic in here. That's actually, I found, that's one of the toughest things in the Finger Lakes. Not so much for the red, but we have a struggle. We have a fight every year getting white wines through mallow lactic. It typically takes us into March in April to wrap that up. Okay. Um, you normally working, just heat sorry. it or? So the, the barrel room we're sitting in right now has radiant heat on the floor. So we're able to, to turn it up to about the mid 60s Fahrenheit or about 18 Celsius, uh, which certainly helps. But we're working with such low pH wines that it, it can't be quite tricky getting some of the white wines through malolactic. Okay, so do you inoculate for for mallow, or you just let it go? And if it does it, it does it. If it doesn't do it, it doesn't do it. The most of them start on their own. If they're really slow, we will eventually inoculate in March or so. Okay, and for the first ferment, you use cultured yeast or ambient yeast? We work mostly with cultured yeast, um, partly because I want the most boring and uninventful first fermentation. And also because we've done extended studies over the years, trying out different yeast strain and uh, so-called wild fermentations. Mm -hmm. And I can only speak from my own experience, but I found that with the vineyard sites that we work with, uh, I'm not able to attribute any sub significant portion of the profile of the wine to, to the yeast strain. Meaning uh, if we break down, uh, a grape lot and ferment some of it with uh, indigenous yeast and some of it with cultured yeast. In the end, there are hardly any differences. I, I see some differences early on, like in December and January, just some of these short-lived fermentation esters lingering around. But by the time we start bottling Riesling or any other wine by May, those are long gone. And we're left with a site-specific uh, aromatics and at that point there are no there are no differences of significance between the different yeast strains. Okay interesting. So then you bottle the the Van Clare and you do the Pries de Mousse and you leave it six years? Yes. Uh, typically the, the fermentation takes six, seven, eight weeks. Uh, we kill our, our warehouse. We, we set it much lower than we normally do bringing it temperatures down into like 58, 59 Fahrenheit and, uh, and just keep it nice and cold out in the, in the warehouse. And then we leave it. We, we leave it, as you said, about six years. So this wine, it was uh, last year, 2019, uh, beginning of the year, we started riddling and, and disgorging the wine. We do uh, most of our riddling and disgorging the first four or five months out of the year when it's so cold outside, it really lends itself mm. to that. Right, okay. And then the dosage is how much? Um, typically three to four grams. Okay, total. so a very yeah. low dosage, huh? Yeah, especially in a riper year like 2012 like this, it, it's on the low side. Um, we, and I think it has to do with a long time, we'll leave it on the lease. If we were to, to compromise and, and shorten that time, I probably would have to go a little bit higher. But waiting, we get more of the creaminess and the softness from, from the lease contact, which allows us to go a little drier. 
Right, exactly. That's one of the things that I loved about this was the lemony freshness and the, the you know, really bright uh, acidity. It's a great food wine. That's how, that's how we think of it. I mean, and Lisa will talk about that in the little wine, but most, most considerations we make here in the cellars are geared towards food and, and wine pairing. It's something we're acutely aware of, but I think it's also something that largely comes natural in a cool climate region such as ours. We naturally have low uh, alcohol percentages, high acidity, crisp wines, and, uh, and the flavor profiles that really lend itself to food pairing. So it's not something we, we really have to, to strive for and elaborate. It comes quite easily. So Lisa, what's your favorite food pairing with the sparkling wine? Gosh, um, my favorite, I'm not sure what my favorite is, but we, it's, it's just so versatile. I pair anything, um, I try to keep it all on the savory, um, um, spectrum right. and just um, nothing that overpowers the wine also um but we have such a um, variety like tonight um, or actually tomorrow night we're doing a a little um small party here um at the winery and i'm pairing it with a little um uh a little tart with um a little bit of a local um blue cheese which is which is pretty mild and then at the top of our driveway we've got a big plum orchard with empress plums and so I roast the plums and then put the plums on top of it. And, and it's so delicious because all the flavors, um, especially when they're, when they're cooked, are, are subtle but um, interesting. And then with the acidic backbone that the um, sparkling lends it, it just, you know, kind of pops in your mouth. And mm. so we try to always start out everything we do with a glass of sparkling. And it's not common because um, I think I feel in the U.S. people don't start a dinner with sparkling. Most people end it with sparkling, like it's something that's supposed to go with dessert or something. Um, so we are always developing new recipes, savory recipes with um, all the foods and the, the cheeses from the farms that we have around the area. Mm. And I'm pairing it with our sparkling. Well, at my house, sometimes we start and finish with sparkling and have sparkling all the way through. So I really- Oh my gosh, I have got to come to your house. <laughs> <laughs> when can we get an invite? <laughs> Anytime. So what do you think about oysters with this? I think this would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. with yeah. We, we tried that earlier this summer. Uh, we, we made a small excursion to Maine and had a chance to test that out. It, it works nicely. <laughs> We're huge oyster lovers. And we've got, I don't know where our kids are oyster lovers, so it kind of makes it expensive when we, <laughs> we have to get oysters. One of our sons, um, his could eat 30 oysters in one sitting. So it's like, gosh. Oh, I believe it. <laughs> I definitely believe it. We might have to meet up on the North Fork of Long Island. They have several people that are doing um, uh, mm. oyster farming. And you can go and sit down by the water and have oysters to your heart's content. But only if they'll let us bring some ravine sparkling wine. So we'll Absolutely. <laughs> that is a great pairing, though, with oysters. One of our favorites. And now we're moving into that, uh, that time of year. I mean, it's definitely got a chill in the air and everybody always says, says some months with R in it, you know, and, and I'm, uh, I'm not a believer in superstition, but, but it's something about the wintertime months. I always think about uh, oysters much more than the summertime. It's not really mm -hmm. not on my list. Yeah. I agree. Absolutely. In the summer, I'm always wanting to eat crab. So that's the... The opposite, mm. side. but the crab would also be a nice pairing with the sparkling wine, don't you think? Oh yeah, absolutely. We do a little crab salad. Um, we do um, a lot of we do little pieces. We do a lot of because we, we have this with appetizer a lot. Um, there's just an endless amount of seafood that you can pair with it, and even um, it would go well with really nicely with sushi um, as well. Mm. Our kids are big lovers of that, so we do a lot of that at home. And the other night we made a couple of um, whole salmon. We poached a couple of them, and um, we had that for um, for some appetizer with a little bit of a of a fur blanc sauce, even if it has a little creaminess or or something like shallots um, or onion. Just that savory, that little bit of intense savory um, aspect, just goes really beautifully with the sparkling. Sounds great. Speaking of which. Um... 
as you're talking about salmon, it started me thinking about the Riesling. Maybe we should go on to the Riesling. What do you think? Absolutely. All right, let me grab my bottle that's in the fridge. <laughs> Yeah, this Riesling, actually the best pairing I had with it this year, it was during COVID and um, our um, daughter's um, boyfriend made this beautiful roasted tomatillo sauce um, with um, capers in it also and then put it over a sea bass that was beautiful. And I have that recipe. Um, so if anybody watching would like that, they can always um, email us at um, info at ravineswine.com, and I'd be happy to send that recipe along. It was just beautiful, I felt. That was I was in love with it. <laughs> that sounds like an amazing, uh, it sounds like an amazing pairing. You know what, I was, I was gonna use my Corbin, and I had a problem with the needle, so I'm gonna have to pull the cork, give me one more second. But maybe you want to introduce the reason while I'm getting mine ready? Sure, so uh, only about a one year into making wine in the Finger Lakes, I had sort of identified the Argus Sanger Vineyard as being an exceptional Riesling site in the Finger Lakes. And by that, I'm talking not about the, the beautiful site and the, the, the location of the vineyard, which in itself is spectacular, but strictly based on the quality of the Riesling coming out of there. And I had a chance to work with it for, for a number of years. And Sam Argett Singer, the, the grape grower and owner of the vineyard at the time, he and I became very good friends. And uh, we kind of, you have this uh, rapport between a grape grower and a winemaker everywhere. But in the Finger Lakes, because of our climate, you really need to develop a, a lot of trust where the, the grape grower is willing to work with you. Uh, leave the grapes out there till they're fully ripe, given what that vintage has to offer. And in return, as a winemaker, you you have to know exactly how to balance things. But we became very good friends, and I'm I'm really honored and, and thrilled to continue to work with Sam's son, Baron Argetsinger now, who's doing a tremendous job managing this kind of tricky vineyard because it's in a fairly cool site, by, even by Finger Lake standard. Hmm. pretty high up uh, above Seneca Lake, um, but with such great potential. Um, it's kind of a, a low vigor site. There's some Howard gravel soil, uh, it's the top soil here in the Riesling, extremely well drained. Um, typical yields here, rarely ever exceeding two tons an acre, which is about 30, 30, 32 hectoliters per hectare. Um, low vigor site, uh, that does extremely well. Being an older established vineyard, it tends to ripen a little bit earlier than some of the other Riesling sites I work with, which in turn allows us to, to really get that nice and ripe most years. And here we're looking at 2016. And up until this year, I didn't think it possible to have a vintage riper than 2016. But 2020 might prove me wrong in this wow. one because that's okay. kind of where we're going now. Um, That's interesting. So what was the bricks when you picked in 16? This was about 22, 22 and a half. Wow, okay. Interesting. Without botrytis, I don't find Riesling to go much higher than that in the Finger Lakes. My, my experience has been that Riesling is one of those great variety that eventually levels out in terms of sugar content, unless you have onset of botrytis, in which case it goes off the chart. But without the botrytis, it tends to level off around that 22, 22 and a half, which I don't mind. I really don't want the alcohol level here much higher since we, we do invariably ferment this dry every year. Right, exactly. And that's, the, that's what I love about it. It has that you know, it's much more of a Alsatian style or an Austrian style than it is a German style, just because of the fact that it's fermented to dryness and it's got that incredible richness without any heaviness. And it's still, it still keeps a very nice freshness. What's the uh, acidity level in the 16? The acidity level here is about eight grams per liter. Um, and the pH, again, it, it's under 3.2. Um, so because of this variation in, in conditions, 
uh, we don't treat every vintage the same way. But in 2016, we realized what a right, nice vintage it was. So this saw about six hours of skin contact before okay. we, we started the press cycle. Um, there were so many wonderful aromas and nice, ripe phenolics to extract from the skins that year. And we were lucky enough to work with a large tank press where I can literally just close off the valve spin the cylinder a few times and let the, leave the grapes in there before starting the press cycle, which is what we did in 16. Okay, but you're putting whole bunches in instead of crushing it before you go to press. Right. Okay, interesting. And then you protect with SO2 in the press or you let it go? We just close the valve, no, no CO2. Okay, interesting. And then yeah. it, uh, it, there's a little oxidation in the press and then it comes back out as it ferments? By the time we harvest Riesling in the Finger Lakes, it's typically quite cool. Mm. <laughs> Even in 16, the season itself was, was started off quite warm. But by the time this was picked, which, as I recall, was the first week of, in October, about a week into October, temperatures were dropping significantly. We're normally seeing temperature, high temperatures in the low mid-50s by then. Okay, interesting. Fahrenheit, so you, do the, you do the ferments for the Rieslings also in stainless? We do a couple of vintages. I've done a fraction of it in old neutral oak barrels, like more than 10 years old. But this one was done entirely in, in stainless steel, um, keeping, uh, keeping it on the lees until the spring. I mean, we eliminate the heavy uh, clay-like lees post-fermentation, right. but keeping it on the lighter fluffy lees right up until the spring. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, I, found, I found the leaves aging being a, a really important tool in the Finger Lakes when we came in 99, and it wasn't really used by anybody back then. But in order to go to the dry end of the spectrum, I needed other ways to work on the roundness and the texture of the wine, and the leaves was clearly the, the first candidate for that. Okay, fantastic. Well, you get an amazing result from this. I have to say, one of the things that... Uh, one of the things that uh, most appeals to me about this is that it has all of those spot on Riesling characters of like peach and white flowers. And, you know, it's got, it's, it's definitely screams Riesling at you, but there's that, that almost earthy character, or it's not really petrol yet because it's not really an age character, but you know what I'm saying? There's like a minerally aspect yeah. to it or an earthy aspect to it. Do you think that comes from the limestone in the soil or what do you attribute that special? Because this to me has much more depth than what you usually get in Riesling. I attribute it to that particular site. I, I really do. It, it's a recognizable feature that we find every vintage coming out of, of the Argentina Riesling, but certainly more pronounced in a, in a really ripe vintage like, like this one in 2016. But there is that stony, mineral, earthy streak in that Riesling every, every single year. It's, it's quite expressive. Um, it really comes out a lot when you're tasting it. That's the thing that really just blew me away about this Riesling. So when you say, so southeast corner, so it's facing northwest sort of, and then the elevation is how high? Um, the vineyard's got to be up 1,050, 1,100 feet elevation. It's several hundred feet uh, up above Seneca Lake, high, high up above it. And wow. I, I so like 350 meters, huh? Yes. Wow. Okay, it, that's pretty high elevation. It really is. And there we have, on two occasions now, we have found, in particular cool years, we have chosen to make a, a sparkling wine out of this wine. We did that in 2013, and we did it again in 2018, where the balance and the ripeness level, in my opinion, lent itself more to a sparkling wine. So on those two occasions, we, we made that decision. Okay, that's interesting. A uh, Zecht style, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, why not? I think that can be successful in the Finger Lakes too. But, uh, but if you didn't make enough of this, I would be very disappointed because this, to me, this is a fantastic wine. So Lisa, what do you like to eat with this? Um, what don't we like to eat with this? 
We, I really enjoy um, also pairings that we get at other restaurants, like at, um, you know, in the city, DB Bistro and um, Blue Hill and Aldo Sam Wine Bar. It's so fun to be able to taste different things. We love, we eat a lot. We have great pork here in the Finger Lakes. And, um, and so we do a lot of um, pork um, pairings with this. And yeah. pork with a little bit of creaminess too. Like um, we have, we grow a lot of our different herbs. And so putting like, a, also the thing I like about our Rieslings in general is they've got like a little bit of a, you know, savory herby character too. And so um, just bringing out some of that, we use a lot of um, local um, onions and herbs and a little bit of great dairy that we have around here is amazing. Um, something as simple as homemade um, pork rinds are, is really amazing. Um, tomorrow night, um, I'm serving this one with actually um, a, a chicken braised in a little bit of Riesling with a, a nice cream sauce with a little bit of um, tarragon and thyme. And um, I'm adding actually some local apples that we have because we're right in the middle of apple harvest too. Mm -hmm. And right at the top of our driveway, we have acres and acres of apples, which is so um, lucky for us. So it's things like that, I think, um, are great pairings with this wine. That sounds amazing. Although you've convinced me now that as soon as the Zoom is over, I'm going to have to go out and get some uh, some pork rinds and, uh, and try that <laughs> pairing because I'm a great lover of pork rinds. Although in Manhattan, they usually call them chicharrones. So uh, I'm definitely going out for some chicharrones after this. But, uh, but I like pork too. So I will tell you, you know, I tried to, sorry about the sirens, but it's Manhattan. They'll go away <laughs> soon enough. But uh, I tried to get some, one second. It's really loud, huh? Usually it's not that loud. They're probably going to pick Trump up at the Trump World Towers, which is like five blocks from my apartment. So. Oh, God. <laughs> so anyhow, I went to Murray's Tea Shop because being a Manhattanite, I love uh, Murray's. And I went to the one in Grand Central Station because the village was kind of too far. And uh, they didn't have any Finger Lakes cheeses, so I was really upset. But I did get a cheese that, that Murray's makes from Vermont. And it's a raw milk cow's cheese. And on the outside, they have fennel pollen. And it's got a really nice, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of that herby thing that you were talking about. But it, uh, it's an aged cheese, so it's, uh, it's very firm. And I think <laughs> they call it Project X. It's one of the ones that they age themselves. Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, we give Murray's, we have in the past given Murray's our wine leaves, our Riesling leaves, so that they can um, wash cheeses um, okay. in leaves. Yeah, and uh, gosh, fennel pollen, we just had that with our chicken soup last night. It's one of our favorites. What a beautiful, um, you know, spice to be able to use, um, wild fennel pollen. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how they do this cheese, except this cheese is washed in Gewürztraminer instead of Riesling, but other than mm. that... Uh, Nice. Very similar. And so to pair with it, I also have pork products. I have a finocchiona, <laughs> so it's like fennel sausage. And uh, mm -hmm. with that and the Riesling, it's a really great pairing. Oh, that's perfect. Hmm. I think that uh, Elevens is, the, so the Michael Broadbent version of Elevens is he doesn't really mention food, but I'm always getting a little bit peckish by 11 o'clock. So I always think that there should be a snack, you know, and then immediately after this, well, if I didn't have an appointment immediately after this, I'd be going to lunch. But I'm always starting to think about food and especially with this wine, I think uh, the idea of, of food pairing is uh, paramount. I mean, it's just, I mean, the, believe me, it's, I could drink it on its own, especially on a hot summer afternoon, but with food, this is really a dream. So it's almost, it's, it's getting close to noon and I don't want to keep people too long. So maybe we should do the red wine. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So the, the Cerise goes back to the first vintage of Cerise for us was 2006. And if you work with 
with Pinot Noir in a cool climate region in the Finger Lakes, you have to be fairly flexible um, because it's a it's a tricky variety to to work with, getting different ripeness levels in different mm. years and different uses. So we farm quite a bit of, of Pinot Noir in the Finger Lakes. I think with 25 acres, we're probably one of the leading Pinot Noir growers, and we use it for sparkling wine for rosé wine, for the varietal Pinot Noir, and for this blend here of Pinot Noir and, and Blauch Frankish. And the first time we made that in 2006, the idea was to make an early drinking, largely on oak, uh, red wine, um, sort of in a Beaujolais frame of mind. And that's kind of how I think of the, of the Cerise. And the name comes from the fact that when we put this Pinot Noir Blaufrankish blend together, the cherry fruit sort of seems to dominate the, the blend. So that's, that's where the name came from. And uh, it's really developed a, a good following at the, at the winery. People are always looking for a, a lighter style red wine. In the summertime, we serve this wine uh, slightly chilled. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's become quite popular. Oh yeah, I definitely agree. So what's the the breakdown between Blaufrankisch and Pinot Noir? Uh, here we're about 60, 40, 60 being uh, Pinot Noir, 40 being Blaufrankisch. Uh, it varies a, a bit from year to year. Uh, we grow the, the, the Blaufrankisch right next to the winery uh, here in, in Geneva, part of White Springs Vineyard. And uh, the Pinot Noir from here came from 16 Falls Vineyard over on the east side uh, of Seneca Lake, where we grow uh, a number of different Dijon clones for, for Pinot Noir. So uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we did here. Um, Black Frankish is kind of a mid-season variety, so it comes in quite a bit later than Pinot Noir. So these are uh, fermented and, and aged separately, and okay. then blended, blended down the road. Do you treat them the same way? Are they both uh, de-stemmed or there's some whole cluster or? For the Cerise, I choose to de-stem all of it. Everything, huh? Yes. Uh, with Pinot Noir in general, in a, in a warm year like we're having this year, we'll go up to about 35% whole cluster uh, for the varietal Pinot Noir. But on the Cerise side, I, I choose typically to de-stem everything. Hmm. Okay. Because the, because the Blaufrankisch already provides quite a bit of structure to, to the wine. So I'm, I'm really looking for the Pinot Noir to bring its softer, gentler, rounder side. Uh, is sort of as, as one of the components in, in this blend here. And how long is the élevage? Um, so the skin contact, typically we're, we're looking at about three weeks. And then, depending on the year, it'll either be aged in uh, older neutral oaks. We also have a number of uh, casks behind us, like you can see behind us, 20 hectoliter casks. Mm -hmm. And then typically, it'll stay in casks from late October until July, August, the following year, when we blend it up and, and bottle it. OK. OK, great. So it's getting like 10 months in neutral yeah. oak. Yeah, the yes. oak doesn't really mark it, and I, I love that about it. It's got that fresh character and that, you know, you're right. I think the cherry fruit definitely comes through, and uh, it's got, like all the wines that we've tasted today, it's got that really appealing freshness and that really juicy character to it that, uh, that I think is amazing. You know, I think, uh, uh, I mean, not to generalize, but I think often people are trying too hard when they're making red wine in New York State and they try and extract more than they should probably extract. And I think you've really hit it very nicely with this one because it's, it's balanced, it's elegant. You know it's red wine. It's got tannin, it's got structure, but right. you're not trying to pull stuff out that, that isn't there. On, and you, know, you don't have any green flavors. There's no herbaceousness or it's it's really a, a lovely very expressive kind of wine yeah that's that's one of the beautiful things about pinot noir is that there are no methoxypyrazines in pinot noir so we don't have to worry about that but you're absolutely right i mean that's really the the driving idea behind our red wine is not to try to overdo it 
Um, we're in a region that lends itself to elegant, balanced wines, and that's what drives us. We, we aim for the winemaking to be relatively transparent so that we, we project that. And that means no excess of oak, which is why we've been over the last couple of years introducing many new casks and slowly backing away in our user barrel um, and kind of handling things on, on the gentler side of things, not trying to, to over extract it. Um, I think that's what the Finger Lakes has to offer and uh, we should respect that. Fantastic. Well, you've done a marvelous job. You know, we're just about right at noon, so maybe we should see if there's any questions. Now, a lot of you are muted by default, but if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions, we're totally taking questions now, and uh, we'll see how long the questions go on, and then we'll wrap up. But uh, are there any questions out there for Morton and Lisa? Charles, not really, um, but I put a few comments in chat about what's happening currently in the UK. I saw that. Very it's so similar to exactly what they described in the Finger Lakes. We are picking as we speak. Fabulous. Wow. I can't wait to get over there and taste some more English sparkling wine. Agree. We brought a case back from England last time we were there. Yeah. <laughs> we're big fans. Yeah, it's going to be a very good year. The sparklings are largely picked. Good acidities, low pH, but lots of fruit. Um, but in fact, even people who are historically only producing sparklings, like Hattingley Valley, for example, are considering using some of their Pinot Noir and Chardonnay to make significant quantities of still wines this year. That's so amazing. Um, I just wanted to also mention that, um, you know, I became a huge fan of this, um, of this series um, when um, we, it got to an age on it. I, a huge, I'm a huge fan of Cru Beaujolais. And this has some of that beautiful, I, you know, beautiful character of Cru Beaujolais. Um, when it has an age on it, all of these wines will age really well. And um, the series also, you know, at our table, um, and in our and at the winery at our um, ravenous table and that we do for our wine club, um, we try for the wine always to be the star. So when we choose um, foods to go with it, they're always a little more on the subtle side. Um, but even just like the beautiful flavors of the pork and um, and herbs and um, even duck and chicken with a wine like this would go really nicely with the cerise. I bet, especially with duck. I'm thinking now it's. Uh... It's game season, so it's... Uh, mm, yeah. We have amazing duck here. <laughs> we, we haven't had a chance to really talk about this, but our 20 years of experience now has shown us that when made in a traditional style like our wines are, these wines have very significant aging potential. Uh, and I saw a question pop up here. So the first vintage of the Argentinian Riesling was 2007, Another warm vintage, uh, which is drinking beautifully right now. I would say it's just now it's coming into its to its prime, but it should stay on, stay on that platform for another five to ten years. Uh, significant aging potential for these wines. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially especially the Riesling and the sparkling wine. Although, you know, I could see the Ceres aging as well, but it's so nice to drink it on the fruit and... Uh, you know, with that beautiful expression of the cherry fruit that it's, uh, it would be hard for me to sit on it for a long time. Yeah, I agree. It, it's, not a, it's not a requirement for those people who are so inclined though, there's, you, you don't need to worry about these, these wines dropping, dropping off the age well, but I agree. I mean, we, we do, a, they, they're certainly approachable early on. You'll also notice from the general vintages of our wine, we, we sit on multiple vintages in our temperature control warehouse before releasing them, um, trying to do our share of, of aging the wine so they're more ready to drink by the time that they, they're out there on the market. Fantastic. You know, Lisa was mentioning um, 
gamay just now. You don't have any gamay, do you? We have just started planting a little bit of gamay ah. and a little bit of uh, savanya. Savanya as well. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting direction. I think uh, there's a few people doing gamay, but not so many. Who does gamay? Sheldrake does it, and that's really the only vineyard I know of. But it's quite popular on the Canadian side in Agra Peninsula. Ah, yeah, that's true. Okay, interesting. And seven in, who's doing? Who else is doing seven in? Are you the only one? I think we're the first one there. Okay, wow, interesting. Are you going to do it what uh, topped up or or uh, aged on the eulage? Are you going to do like a, a banjon style or a huile style? To be determined. <laughs> we'll see what we get to work with. Uh, both Lisa and I really enjoy those types of wines, so we'll we'll see what we have to work with. First, we need to make sure it survives the winter here. Right, right, exactly. Well, but if it's from the Jura, you would think it would it would uh, stand a chance, anyhow. That was my rationale. I mean, that's about as cold as any French wine region, so I I like the odds. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to see what it, uh, what it produces. It's been uh, a fantastic journey. Well, unless there's any other questions, maybe we'll wrap up. Are there any, any more questions? We're happy to take more questions, but we're getting lots of uh, thank yous in the chat box, which usually means people are ready to sign off, which I get. And you know, an hour is a good amount of time. And if you drag on 11s is too long, then it runs straight into lunch. And it's almost lunch. And uh, after after chatting with Lisa about the pro appropriate food matches, I need to go eat some more of my my Murray <laughs> and uh, Pinocchiona for lunch. And uh, that's it. But I'm so glad that everybody came. I hope you all enjoyed uh, uh, the conversation, and hopefully you all enjoyed the wines and uh, ravines. It's one of my favorites. So thanks and cheers, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having us. And if well, anyone uh, needs um, eat, needs recipes, they can email us at ravines. I mean, at info at ravineswine.com. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I may just be writing to you for recipes. You know, awesome. I had a, a recipe that I that I made uh, yeah. recently, and I had your wine with it, and I thought it was quite successful. Mm. I made a New York State choucroute, and I started with uh, sausages from that uh, place in. Rochester that makes the the whites and the, they make like hot dogs, but they also make this white sausage. And then oh. I got some duck confit from the Hudson Valley, and oh. I ended up with the sauerkraut and a little bit of riesling. And so I made a New York State uh, choucroute, and I had it mm. with your riesling, and it was uh, really good. So I, I love that recipe. Recipe, if you like. Okay. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Uh, thank you guys. It was a lot of fun and the wines were fantastic and they showed really well. Have thank a great afternoon, everybody, and thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.